The Phileas Club is entirely financed by its Patreons at patreon.com slash the Phileas Club. If you enjoy the show, if you get something out of it, please do consider becoming a patron. The link is in the show notes. Hey everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Phileas Club. This is episode number 121. And we talk about China, the trade war, Huawei, and more. We talk about the Gilets Jaunes and the Grand Débat. And we talk about Brexit and what it meant, what it means, what it will mean. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Phileas Club. This is a show where we get people from different parts of the world. We get them together in one podcast and ask them, what's been happening in your part of the world, good sir or lady? Uh, what do people think of what's happening in your part of the world or in any part of the world? And we try to get different perspectives, different uh, cultural backgrounds to kind of uh, put things at a different angle and enable us to actually understand them better instead of just listening to the rhetoric over and over and over again on 24 hours news channels. I hope that's the goal. I'm not saying we managed to do it, but that's the goal. My name is Patrick Beja. I'm currently in Finland, but I'm originally from France. Uh, with me on the show are two wonderful gentlemen. On one side, the eastern side, uh, because he is in China, is Eric Olander, a good friend of the show. How's it going, Eric? It's wonderful to be back. So great to speak with you. You are in Shanghai right now. Um, what Shanghai. time is it for you? It is now uh, eight o'clock in the evening, so it's a civilized time. Normally, these podcasts where I do things with the U.S. or Europe, they want me to stay up till twelve or one or two in the morning. So I'm relieved that we're doing this at eight. <laughs> that's that's absolutely the goal of this show to be civilized and gentlemen like. Uh, it's two p.m. for me, so we're not so far away. And I'm talking about gentlemen. Obviously, the next guest is uh, one because first. He's drinking tea as we're recording this. And uh, second, as you understand, because he's drinking tea, he's from the UK. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you for uh, hey. being on the show. Yeah, it's no problem at all. It's, uh, it's, it's good to be talking to you. You are... Um, so we're going to be talking about China first. We're going to be talking about France second. But we, uh, I'm really burying the kind of bearing the lead because the really interesting part of the show is going to be the last one. Uh, because, Gareth, you are crazy enough to come and talk about the fact that you think Brexit might be a good idea. Um, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, obviously don't, uh, we'll, we'll save the, uh, save the, the meat and potatoes of the, of the, of the chat until later on. But yeah, you know, I think it's, uh, we, we need some people that have been positive about, about people's assumptions about Brexit and why mm -hmm. people have made the decision that they think it's a good idea. So, um, yeah, I can't, I can't guarantee I'm going to be positive about it, but what I will <laughs> promise is what we always do on the show, which is try to get away from the uh, angry rhetoric, as I mentioned, and at least try to listen to the people on the other side and kind of understand where they're coming from. So hopefully we will manage to do that. Even if we part ways disagreeing, we'll at least shake hands when we're parting ways, but we'll see. Maybe yeah. you'll convince me. Maybe after this show, I'll, I'll be all uh, Frexit, like, uh, you know, defending. Possibly. I, I don't think I'm that good, but, you know, we'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see for sure. Um, and so, yeah, I, I figured we could start uh, with China and uh, what's been happening in China and the important... What The way we do this is that we usually go to the person's uh, uh, local headlines and newspapers and activity and ask them what's been making the headlines. And uh, it, it's not necessarily local stuff, but when I asked you uh, about that, Eric, you mentioned that uh, there were a few things, Huawei, uh, the economy, and the, the trade war with the US, which obviously is uh, pretty important in, in China. Um, so can you tell us, I, I, I'd love to start with the trade wars because it's, we only get the side of the, the Western countries, I think, uh, mostly. And uh, I'm not sure how the Chinese are taking it. So could you well, let us know? The, the problem with trying to understand how the Chinese are taking it is they get a highly filtered version of news. So they are getting news that is intensely censored. 
Uh, it's very difficult to talk about it in a public space that is on social media or on in the media or columnists and things like that. Uh, people talk about it, but they have very uh, – they feel like, again, they're being victimized by the United States. States here. They don't really fully understand the depths of the grievances that Americans feel about the relationship with China, particularly economically. So you may disagree with Donald Trump. You may not like any of his policies, but Trump does deserve some credit for actually calling the Chinese bluff here. Because for 20, maybe 30 years, the Chinese have said, we're going to open, we're going to reform, we're going to play by the rules, we're going to stop stealing IP, we're going to you know, be a responsible power. And for the most part, the Bush administration, Bush one, Bush two, Obama, Clinton, they all went along with it. And and in some ways, and again, I'm looking forward to having our discussion about the Gilets Jaunes, about the, the Yellow Jackets in France, because there's a relationship between the grievances that working class people in Europe and the United States have and the rise of China. Yeah, I think so, there's, a, there's a, a very common theme uh, in all of this, even if we're going to address them very differently. Uh, so before we, we dive into that question uh, about China, I do have to ask you, um, aren't you, if you're going to be talking about this a little bit more candidly and talk about censorship, aren't you a little bit worried uh, for yourself? Or, you know, are you, uh, first very practical question, are you using a VPN to use Skype or to get your news? No, like you, you, you don't need a VPN to use Skype, uh, but you need a VPN to, to access any of the other websites that we in the West largely take for for granted. So Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, uh, most of the major news sites uh, you cannot get domestically in China. So You're in theory, constantly... any, Chinese, any Chinese citizen could also use a VPN and get unfiltered news? Sure, they could. But why would they? Because they have such a rich, dynamic ecosystem of content that they don't really feel the need to. There's not a, a burning desire to get the New York Times to jump over the Great Firewall to do it. Uh, there's, I mean, this is probably the most dynamic uh, content media system in the world. I mean, it's just highly filtered and censored and restricted, uh, but there's a lot of choice here for people within the walls that they're in. So they don't feel there's a need to go outside the wall. A very small percentage of people actually do use VPNs here. So it's not a primary concern of the government. In terms of how I feel about expressing myself, I have been creating content in communist authoritarian states now for eight years. And it's one of these things where you and involved in China now for 30 years. And it's one of these things where you are constantly aware of the threat. So the the best analogy that I like to use is that is the the python in the chandelier in the, over the dinner table. It just sits there. And you never really know that it's there because it quietly comes down. And by the time <laughs> that the python comes down and gets you, it's too late. Generally speaking, <laughs> for the cheery. most part, I, it is. I mean, it's no, but let me just be very clear here and blunt. It is, these are very, very tense times for content creators in China, mostly Chinese. Um, the government is cracking down. The party is cracking down. The, the range of what can be said is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. Um, voices, when you want to interview people or talk to people, uh, professors, scholars, analysts about any of these things, uh, they say no because they are afraid of crossing a line. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, the content that I talk about in the China and Africa podcast that I produce and what I write about doesn't touch on any of the major red line issues. And the red line issues are China's borders, the supremacy of the Communist Party, uh, you know, political leaders and things like that. I don't get anywhere near those simply because the content that I focus on doesn't really have anything to do with that. Um, and so in that sense, I'm, I'm okay, but I'm always humble and respectful of where I am. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, you do have to be aware of it. But if you are just talking in broader generalities, that's one thing. The other thing that's a very important distinction is if you are speaking in Chinese to a Chinese domestic audience – they are much more sensitive about that than if you are speaking in English to an international audience. They're right, not because as I figured about that. one of the uses of a VPN uh, could be to access uh, sites, you're right, that maybe they're not interested in, in what the New York Times would be saying, but what if there is a, you know, distant faction of uh, people who create media targeted at the Chinese population that could be accessed via VPN. I'm guessing either, you know, the Chinese secret police would send their version of the CIA to shut that down, 
or I mean, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, I mean, it it it's actually it's a non-issue in that sense. They're as interested in consuming dissident overseas media as an American is consuming dissident overseas media from an from an American expatriate, and they're not. I mean, it's I just guess, not their thing. Right. I mean, right. No, I, I understand. Mean, there's, I, there's a small. I mean, the country this big let me just be honest a country this big always has a small faction of someone who wants to do something so i don't want to there's no absolutes here right. but generally speaking in the day-to-day the average chinese does not feel the need to jump the firewall it's um, really even at my office at my office we have a built-in firewall we're permitted to have a firewall in my office uh, we have a license from the government that allows us to ex- access outside the, the firewall but a lot of my staff on their phones, don't use VPNs. And I say, well, do you want, you can, it's easy. You can just log on to our, our Wi-Fi, and you can get it. And they say, yeah, what am I going to get? I don't really care. And it's that's really their attitude. interesting because we get this image, I think in, in the West that if we were living in a, uh, you know, authoritarian regime, we would be seeking out, uh, the truth or although the truth has become a loaded word fact, nowadays, but seeking out the outside in something. And it seemed you're saying, They don't even care. They don't. No. You know, here, here's the interesting thing. And Evgeny Morozov, the great uh, former Harvard scholar, he's a, a writer on new media. He wrote this great book about six, seven years ago, and it, and it documented what did uh, East Germans do when they started getting access to information. They wanted porn. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh. if you gave people an unfiltered Internet, what they would do is they would probably do in this order. They would watch porn, play video games. Uh, look at gossip and entertainment sites, and maybe fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, eighty fifth down on the list go for news. We I, have I this can't naive really fight notion you on this, but it's it's. But that's I, what people do on the internet. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I know. All right. Well, they, they, this could be a whole episode with. <laughs> it could be a whole episode in itself. So it's not like too deep. <laughs> Let's the rabbit get back hole. to the more serious side of things here. Yeah, exactly. The, the, here, the main issue that's here right now is in the broader umbrella of economic. That is the trade war. People know what's going on in the sense that they know that they're embroiled in this nasty battle with the United States. They don't always understand the details of it, probably just as much that most of the average American doesn't fully understand the details of why they are embroiled in a trade war with China. Secondly, there is this kind of brewing conflict that really escalated today with Huawei. And Huawei is is very interesting because in the United States, mostly in the United States, and to some extent in Europe now, uh, or in the Five Eyes country, which is the Canadians, New Zealands, British, Americans, and I'm missing one, um, this the five that, that share information to each other. They're yeah, all yeah. agreeing that Huawei is a security threat. Uh, there was the indictments were handed down by the U.S. government today. Uh, the Eastern District Court of New York, uh, the federal court in New York, handed down the indictments, which very important distinction here. That's not the Trump administration. So these are separate things. This is being done by the Justice Department. So the indictments came down today. That really sparked a wave of anxiety here in many respects. And the anxiety is from a lot of different coming from a lot of different areas. Huawei is a national champion. People love Huawei here. They see it as they're really, again, a it's a national brand for them. Uh, people are very, you know, Huawei phones are number one in this market. Uh, they, they're very close to the brand. You have Huawei technology everywhere you go. Huawei sponsors football clubs. Huawei is just pervasive in terms of what it does in daily Chinese life. And so when they see it coming under attack, And what they perceive as an attack, uh, it stirs up nationalism, patriotism, pride. So you're seeing people kind of getting online saying, I'm not going to buy Apple anymore. I'm going to start really going for the P20 instead of the iPhone. Mm. Um, they're really trying to rally around the brand. And what's interesting is how Americans and Chinese are just talking past each other. We I really could- don't understand Yeah, presumably there's a there's an amount of obviously with the restrictions on what what can and can't be accessed from China. There's also there's the issue where maybe from from the West standpoint, the information that's been provided is not, not necessarily tr- balanced. Yeah, or, or no, uh, so, so they, there's big gaps when you talk to even educated Chinese who are in the space of again professors, think tanks, uh, you know, people who are who you think would have kind of a broader worldview, there's massive gaps in their knowledge. And one of the the key things is that they're not understanding where we are coming from. 
they're not understanding the context of understanding where where we are right now in American and European culture. And and it's it's really a very difficult thing for them to understand. The security fears are legitimate. They're real. The problem is there's no evidence of it. So for all the huff and puff that the United States has made about Huawei, there is yet to be any verifiable evidence. So so when you say they, they don't understand when you say they don't understand where we're coming from, are you saying security issues don't matter to them in that way or like because it it would seem relatively easy to understand why we're concerned even if they think there's no reason to be concerned, right? Or uh, can you we elaborate on that? different definition of privacy and security than we do. So one of the mistakes that Europeans and Americans make is that we think that the way we see the world is a universalist way, that rights are, everybody sees human rights the same way, everybody sees privacy the same way, all of these things, everybody just assumes in the US that, well, of course you want to protect your privacy, right? Well, there is very little sense of privacy in this culture. Uh, and this is not just in China, in Vietnam, it was the same way and whatnot. So the idea that Uh, Huawei could be used to spy on you is just not a primary concern here for people. But they understand uh, that it that that it could happen, and they just say, "Well, fine. What what if it does?" To like, if they think about, maybe they don't th even think that far, kind of uh, 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 metaphorically. Just, I, I but they, they don't powerless in the whole scheme of things. The same way that I'm powerless. I mean, really, we think about it, but we don't have any power to do anything about it. So they kind of think, well, if this happens, it happens. So mm -hmm. number one is th they also haven't been raised I mean, in this. Sorry, just to, of just to, sure. to, to uh, catch you on that, we do have the power. We can decide to not use Huawei products, <clears throat> but you're saying they don't even think about that. Well, surely no. part, of the, part of the problem is that it doesn't matter whose products you're using, they could potentially be spying on you you know they could potentially be exfiltrating data to anywhere so but would it eric would do you think it would be the same opinion if it was um apple so if there were concerns that apple was was taking people's data and doing something with it would it be the same opinion with it being a, a u.s company rather than a, no. a chinese company I don't think, again, privacy and data is and data ownership are not paramount concerns in these cultures so they don't even care about the whole issue they don't no But let's not delude ourselves here. We in the, in the West or outside of China, we know about what Facebook does, but yet we still volunteer to give them all the information and they take everything from us. Well, that's so it's not a question the fact whether you know or don't know. Well, I mean, you know, the, I think there is an intellectual difference between knowing knowingly giving your your data to a corporation that is going to use it to uh, make money. And being spied on by a, a alleged government agent that is going to use that data to potentially uh, attack your interests. I, I, We know for a fact from the Snowden files that the NSA did spy on traffic going through the major social media networks in Google. Right, right. And there's every assumption to assume that that's continuing to some degree or another. Yet, has that discouraged anybody in the United States Well, some people, but has it discouraged any sizable, significant population of people from abandoning Facebook? No. I, I'd Facebook argue it's not the same thing, but reforms? yeah, I, I, I'd but, argue it's not but, the same thing. I just you're... don't think we should put ourselves on some kind of pedestal that we have information and we know, and therefore, you know, we're different when the, when here they don't really care because again, the definition of privacy is something very different. I gave a lecture to a university class in Vietnam and I said, you know, what do you think about online privacy? What's your thought? And they looked at me as if I was just from the moon. They had no concept of privacy because in their lives, They live with their families, so their mothers and fathers know everything that they do. They have the government, which is highly intrusive in their lives. Their teachers are highly intrusive in their lives. Their lives are much more open in the sense that they don't have the expectation that anything that they do is private. So this idea that their online traffic is being taken mm. by a government, a corporation, or something else like that, eh. And this is what Jack Ma has said uh, repeatedly, the Alibaba C, uh, chairman. He says, the reason why Europe will never produce a global technology company is because European countries obsess too much on privacy. So that's why the United States and China will dominate the next, gen the next age of computing because we don't pay as much attention to privacy and okay. the Chinese don't either. So I, here yeah, in this the, the, sense, again, coming back to the Huawei issue today, people don't 
understand why the United States is so concerned. So they look at it as an extension of the political problems that they're having with the United States, and they just see this as a proxy war for the ongoing trade dispute, and really this idea that the United States is trying to contain or box China in around the world, which the Americans have said they want to do as much. Right. It's. I mean, that's definitely the the part of the concern that the U.S. and possibly some European countries have. Um, okay, I'm not going to go back to the privacy issue. That also could become an entire conversation, but at least I think we understand how the Chinese people see it. Um, so the sentiment towards the U.S. is, I guess, if I understand correctly, that China is being targeted unfairly and that the the, the grandeur of the Chinese culture and uh, economic efforts is being attacked, correct? It, to some extent, there is a sense that everything's going to be okay. You know, when I talk to people, they just go, you know what, we've been through these difficult times before, we're just going to, we're going to power through it. And I think there is a, a certain thinking in Beijing that says, we just got to get through the Trump administration and hopefully a sane Democrat or Republican will come in and we can get back to normal. I think that's naive. We're never really going back to normal. The interesting thing about the China issue in the United States is that there are so few issues that unite red and blue, Democrat and Republicans. I mean, there's virtually nothing that we agree on. <laughs> it's, it's rather remarkable. We are such a split, divided society. But yet, China is the one thing that brings Democrats and Republicans together, for different reasons, albeit. But yet, at the end of the day, everybody agrees that enough is enough. Mm. And, and that's the part where I think that the Chinese need to do more to understand the source of the grievances and not just kind of float promises that they have broken repeatedly in the past. Now, remember, we just had the Marriott hack uh, a few months ago where 500 million names with passport numbers and credit card informations were taken from Marriott. And from what the reporting says, that was done by the Chinese. And, and that's the kind of stuff that people are just fed up with. Enough. And then to the end of the, you know, now it's looking like Chinese auto companies are starting to expand in Europe and the United States. And a lot of people are raising the issue of like, wait, that's not fair. How is it that American and European companies that come to China have to enter into joint ventures, hand over technology and do all the things that the government forces them to do? And yet they can walk into the United States or France or the UK and open up their own dealers without having any joint venture partners. This is the inconsistency that people are frustrated about. And that the you Chinese know, I mean, people. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Sorry, I was just going to say that, you know, surely that is a that's one of the side effects of being in a more open uh, economic country right you know people can just turn up and set up shop and start selling things so that that kind of goes hand in hand <laughs> there, <laughs> you know there is but but there's nothing that stops the congress in the united states from saying you know we're going to start passing a law that says uh, any non-market economy with a population of 1.2 billion or more that happens to be you know west of this <laughs> you know of this of this line in the pacific ocean if they choose to come into the united states they have to to do, uh, they have to find joint venture partners. Um, the Congress can do anything it wants to do. And more and more, I am frustrated by the discussion in the United States about decoupling. And decoupling is not really an option. I spoke with an Apple executive. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not ago. familiar with, with that concept. What's decoupling? So decoupling is this idea that's being promoted by conservatives and by hawks in the United States to cut the supply chains between United States companies and China. Oh, right. Yeah. So that means the idea that you're going to separate the United States from China so there's no more dependence on China. It is, it's a really interesting concept because, one, it shows a blatant naivete about how supply chains work simply because you think about the iPhone. Apple needs to scale up a production of 10 to 15 million iPhones in time for its launch. It usually gives the final designs about 30 days before so Honhai, who makes most of the, the iPhones, has about four weeks to go from zero to 10 million iPhones. That massive global supply chain of minerals from the Congo, of little screws from southern China, of chip processors from Korea, you name it, all has to come together in 28 days. There is no one else in the world who can do that at that scale. You can't do that in Cambodia, in Vietnam. You, and the New York Times just ran saying they can't even get the supply chains in the U.S., so, so this is this decoupling idea is a fantasy that a lot of people have, but it's something that they really feel is critical to do. 
But that's so the, the thing. Idea. The, the, the thing, it, and it goes both ways, because obviously that's something that a lot of people have been talking about. The interdependency, which also is important in other countries, is healthy for both uh, countries. And the, the, if uh, uh, Honghai or Foxconn or whoever doesn't have a place to sell or to get orders for uh, those phones from, then they also stand to lose a lot. So that interdependency in, in the uh, eyes and reasonings of many means that, you know, we've crossed the Rubicon and we can't, uh, uh, the, the trade war isn't really even real. It's kind of uh, posturing and in the end it's going to result in nothing because the countries are way too interconnected. And, and interdependent. And I'm guessing the Chinese don't see it like that either, it's like many Americans as well. But Well, I mean, I think the Chinese are trying to get themselves out of the current trade war because it is having an impact. Mm. But if you think that the American, that they're ever going to be a dependent on American soy or American pork or American beef or oranges no, from California they're, or no, Florida, but they're, they're ever dependent, again? They're dependent on American money from people who buy iPhones and European money. And so to a certain me... to to a certain extent, but don't overhype that. This is the mm. second largest economy in the world with the with the largest retail market in the world. This is a country that did twenty eight trillion dollars with a T. Yes, twenty eight trillion dollars in e commerce tra in online transactions. It's so you're saying we remarkable we, we, scale. We, we they need have them an more than they need us. Well, I'm saying that if you fall off the edge of the earth. It will be terribly painful for the Chinese, there is no doubt, but it won't put them in back into the Ice Age economically, necessarily. That is their thinking, in, in part. There's a will massive it? domestic market here. Remember, mm. Huawei sells $100 billion of telecom equipment every year without selling pretty much anything into the United States. Mm. All right. Well, we, we do have to move on. Um, I did have a million more questions. But, uh, <laughs> it's yeah, it, it could definitely be discussed for a long time. We're going to touch back on some of those themes, uh, I'm sure. Gareth, did you have anything you wanted to add? I'm I'm seeing your icon light up before we move on. Uh, no, just that I, I think I think the 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 trade war is probably real. You know, it's probably there and it is happening, but there's not an obvious sensible solution. And I think, yes, we, right. again, That's there might exactly. be another theme that we come back to. Is, How do we get out of this thing? Well, yeah, I was all, wondering... It's all well and good fighting, but... <laughs> yeah, I, I, I want to float the idea to, to Eric. Sorry, Gareth, I keep interrupting okay. you. The, the connection with China is delaying everything. <laughs> but, uh, okay, I'll keep going then. Um, the, the idea I wanted to float to Eric was the day that the Chinese export enough and have uh, built up their brands enough that they want to protect their intellectual property and need the business from outside uh, uh, sufficiently, maybe that is the day that they care enough about those issues to kind of find a, a, a common ground with the Western nations. It, I guess the day that the economy in China is old enough that uh, it's, it's, re, it's uh, reached ours, then at that point, our interests might align a little bit more. But Possibly, know, but sense. just very quickly, and I know we have to move on, but they're thinking about this in a very, very different way way, and it's a way that we fundamentally in the West do not understand. Kevin Rudd, who's the former Australian prime minister, said it best. In the mind, when somebody said, how is it possible that the Chinese can rationalize the theft of so much intellectual property? And in the minds of a lot of the senior Chinese elites, not the guy on the street, they're carrying a chip on their shoulder from the opium wars. Hmm. No okay. joke. This is Kevin Rudd's theory. These, these people are going back over 100 years to say, you messed with us, we feel that we are entitled to mess with you. So and it's, it's, it's conscious, a, it's it, like, it's, it's, it's willful. It's like, yes. well... Oh, this is part of a, oh, absolutely it's conscious. I mean, they're not naive and stupid. Well, I, mean, I wouldn't say know, that, but I, I mean, was wondering when, if it's like part of the, so much ingrained in the culture that IP isn't really something you protect. Just like I've, I might have mentioned a few times, but um, in in uh, cooking, for example, there's no uh, copyright. In, in uh, clothes design, there's no copyright in the West. So... I would figure maybe in the in the East, there's no copyright in other areas as well. And it's just as natural as you not being able to cook, to, to copyright a recipe uh, for us. So, but you're saying well, there's more there, than that. There's, there's a, a bit more than well, that. Well, there is a little bit. There's two things going on. On the one hand, people do place a greater value on physical things. Rather, so copying mm. art, for example, is something that is frowned upon. It's a physical object. And copying that, a lot of people say, ah, that's cheap. Copying something intellectual, a piece of software, code, and whatnot, 
traditionally has not had the same level of uh, of value. That said, as you pointed out, now that China is the largest e-commerce country in the world, is very innovative with its tech companies, is doing a lot of great own its own IP, uh, they are becoming much more cognizant of that. So that is changing. But that's different than, say, the government policy. And the government policy, in many respects, is guided, what I think, by what Kevin Rudd said, which is the sense of historical justice that they're getting back. And again, we look at that and our eyes just you know, cross with confusion, like, wait, what? Uh, but they have a very different sense of time and a sense of victimization from the West uh, that dates back for a very, very long time. Yeah, I think that's probably fair. Uh, <laughs> and uh, not just for China. Uh, all right. Let's get back a little bit closer to home. And for me, home is Paris. So I'm going to be talking about the Gilets Jaunes, which we've mentioned on this uh, show a few times. Um, the, the yellow jacket, for those who don't know, I, I'm guessing it's difficult to ignore or to, to not be aware of. Uh, it's a movement that started essentially on Facebook, uh, gathering a lot of unhappy, usually working class uh, people or, you know, working class to lower middle class class. Overall, it, there's a lot of people who sympathize with that movement, uh, who have been uh, stri not even striking, demonstrating in the streets of the whole country for close to three months now, and uh, a little bit before that with less uh, visible activity. And that has uh, provoked a, a, a crisis in the government because the movement is so powerful that uh, it is difficult, it is impossible to ignore. So the government has uh, had to make a few changes. And one of those changes, actually, before we get to the way Macron's government and Macron himself are trying to address this issue, I do want to ask uh, each of you, because of course, for the economy and Huawei and all of this, it's being discussed, I think, the Chinese economy and Huawei and the trade wars, it's being discussed everywhere. It's a global uh, issue. The Gilets jaunes, I think, have been discussed when they were in on the Champs-Élysées and breaking a lot of stores and, and essentially uh, creating what many news outlets uh, portrayed as a, uh, a civil war in France. There was one weekend that was really bad. Mostly it wasn't as bad as people thought. But um, is it still making the news in the UK or has it ever, Gareth? Uh, do you hear about the Gilets jaunes? Yeah, I mean, it, it's it's been in the news, definitely. Um, I think my my kind of first... Uh, the first time I became aware of it was was when it was being reported in the UK as it was being related to fuel prices, um, and I think it's kind of it's changed a little bit from that. Whether that's what yes. it was originally, and it's it's just the reporting in the UK that was a little bit out there. I think possibly. No, it was um, it was that originally. Um, <clears throat> it was kind of like the 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 straw that broke the camel's back, and then it expanded yeah. to the whole camel. So <laughs> yeah, so yeah, the whole the whole camel's going now. Um, yeah, so it is. You know, it it does still definitely make the news. Um, uh, I, you know, I think it's a very similar, um, a very similar issue to what's what's caused you know the, the Brexit vote in the UK, and the election of Trump in in the states. There's a, there's a very a very close similarity, I think, between people being Definitely. upset and feeling like they're not being listened to, um, and it's just manifesting in slightly different ways in different countries. I think. Absolutely, no, that's that's undeniable. It is the same. Uh, movement that is uh, uh, taking different shapes. I, I wonder if it's being reported on in China. I'm guessing anything from the outside that's being, or from the inside that's being reported on in China is being reported on by, because it somehow serves uh, the government's uh, purposes. <laughs> But no, I don't. I wouldn't boil it down to that simplistic. Never assign conspiracy what mediocrity will do. Uh, the government <laughs> isn't that, uh, you know, isn't that 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 focused on it, you, you know, in that sense. Uh, so not everything that passes through serves a government purpose. Uh, okay. You know, in terms of the the news coverage of this in the Chinese press, the I, I see two different kind of takes on it. Number one is they do a very, very dry standard news that these protests happened in Paris. They, you know, this amount, these number of people were injured, this number of people were arrested, and it's just very nuts and bolts. Here's just some basic facts. There's, they don't really go into what some of the underlying uh, concerns are. Now, that might just because be because people here don't really care that much about the details. Um, more likely, it's because the journalists themselves in China may not understand kind of the fundamental, the what's behind it all. 
and then generally speaking, the Chinese don't really like anti-government protests. So right. they also probably don't <laughs> want to kind of inspire anybody else to do the same thing. Uh, but sense. there's another kind of type of coverage, which is, I would say, is much more common. Um, Paris is the the number one overseas travel destination for Chinese tourists. And I think Chinese tourists are the number one arrivals in France. A very oh, important we have many of them. A market. <laughs> you do. And, the, you know, a lot of the Chinese hard-earned money uh, supports a lot of businesses in France. Uh, so people are much more concerned about their vacations and their holidays and so their, their security as well. And I think France for the past two, three years or maybe five years has really struggled with Chinese tourists because of the terrorist attacks and now followed by the civil unrest. Uh, and Chinese tourists are a very, you know, fickle bunch. And so there is a risk here financially for the French that uh, tourists will kind of be booked elsewhere if, if, mm. if the uncertainty continues. Well, I'm sure short term, but, you know, as long as we have Vuitton bags, uh, they'll, they'll yes. come back. <laughs> That's true. There is a, and, you know, France is irresistible in that sense. So. That's, yeah. I, thank you for, for uh, stro stri stroking me the right way for <laughs> just a little bit, Fla uh, flattering our collective ego. Um, Yeah, I, I mean, it's it's an, uh, uh, completely uh, anecdotal, is that a word, uh, uh, piece of, of story. But I've been asked a couple of times going down the Champs-Élysées by uh, people that I think were Chinese uh, to go into the Vuitton store and buy a, a bag or two. They had the cash in hand um, for them because they we have to place limits. Uh, otherwise, what happens is that they buy them here and uh, sell them back in China for much more money. And well, no, uh, I don't know if it, it happens what, still, but it's, it's not that they're, they're selling it for, they're not scalping them necessarily. The problem is there's a 30% luxury tax on, on those items here. So they're, they've been tasked by their friends and their families that when you go to France, buy me a bag for me and then bring it back. So a lot of it is they're just buying it for friends and family who don't want to pay the 30% luxury tax. Right. I think in this case, it was people who wanted more than a couple. And so they would stand <laughs> in the streets. And, but anyway, so yes, we have a lot of Chinese tourists. We love them because they make our economy run in that sense as well. Uh, but so getting back to the Gilets Jaunes, the... Uh, the thing is, we're, I'm not going to talk about there's uh, issues of police violence. On one side, people are screaming about that. And on the other side, people are screaming about uh, the riots being a real issue. Um, and I could talk about all of this, but I think it's probably problems that you've t heard about, uh, f about the Gilets Jaunes or other types of demonstrations in other countries, maybe a million times. I think a more interesting thing to look at is the way Macron is trying to address uh, the issue and the um, initiative of the Grand Débat, the Great Debate, which I think might be a, a, an interesting way of dealing with this um, uh, problem of the sentiment from a, a lot of the population that they're not being listened to And that kind of becomes a machine that is unstoppable. You know, we have this uh, uh, this voicing of concerns, but then it's very hard to uh, address the concerns or to to show that they've been heard. And so the people who are voicing the concerns are often uh, uh, too so far gone in in their uh, frustrations that they don't even want to listen to anything. So. We are having one of the components of the many components of the uh, uh, discussions we're having now is the, the fact that a lot of people are saying, all right, we heard you. We understand there's a real problem here and we will work on it. But it's kind of just settle down on the demonstration for like three months or six months. You can't come back if you think we haven't done anything. But for now, just, you know, it... If you keep screaming, it doesn't really serve any purpose. And of course, the people on the other side are saying, listen, uh, we've been screaming for a long time. You only started listening when we went down in the streets and broke a couple of stores <laughs> on the Champs-Élysées. So we're not going to stop screaming until you actually show us that you've heard us, which I think both uh, make kind of sense. Um, the, the, the way that Macron is trying to address uh, this issue is by creating this grand débat which is essentially a series of open uh, discussions and debates 
in the whole country, uh, there's kind of the, the mayors, and uh, so the mayors are the elected officials that are the closest to the people, the, the quote-unquote lowest level in government, and they are tasked with... Uh, getting assemblies together um, and anyone can request one in their own town and they will discuss issues. There are a few themes that are proposed, but anything is welcome. And uh, they will put everything down on paper, get it back up to the ministries. And within a few, a couple of months, two, three months, uh, the government will propose a number of measures um, that should be, and, and I think this is where the uh, opportunity lies, which could also be squandered, squandered if it doesn't uh, materialize correctly. They will come back with a list of things they are going to do and issues they are going to address and how they are going to address them. Um, for example, one of the, requir the, the, the things that people want is... Um, uh, the référendum d'initiative uh, citoyenne, which is essentially a referendum, uh, a, a way to get people heard uh, by referendum, which I argued last episode, referendums are a terrible way of getting people heard because you get a yes or no answer to a very difficult question. Uh, but Bart explained to us how it's being done in Ireland and uh, with the author judicial authority and making sure the right questions are asked the right way, it can be done. So maybe there is inspiration to be gathered there. Uh, there's things like counting uh, blank votes in uh, in elections that could be done, and of course many many other things. So, I I I think for me in a way the the fact that this happened, I think I might have mentioned it in an editorial I did for the patrons of the Phileas Club on Patreon. Um, this is actually possibly the best time for it to happen because during an election, if you um, or during a referendum, I'm looking at Gareth right now, if you, if you ask people to make a decision, you might not be happy with the result. Um, but if there's no election, no referendum, and people say you're unhappy, they're unhappy, you might come up with a decent way of uh, answering those frustrations. And so we still have two or three years until the next election. Of course, he might, Macron might lose, someone else might come in, it might be terrible. But... Um, the, 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 that great debate concept, if it comes to something that actually addresses the issues, might be an opportunity to sort of address the problems of the uh, large working class that has been expressing those frustrations everywhere um, and, and maybe get out of that impossible uh, uh, merry-go-round. So... Yeah, I mean, it, it sort of sounds to me like, uh, and, you know, this may be a, a slightly naive point to come from but it sounds like that's kind of how democracy is supposed to work um but that it doesn't actually seem to work like that uh, I mean, particularly for for me that's that's <laughs> that's yeah. how it seems so you know you have a member of parliament in the uk you vote for that member of parliament based on on a very broad set of what of what you know they say they will do uh they get in they're then in for an amount of time until the next election but once they're in, there's, there doesn't seem to be any kind of accountability. They can just do what, whatever they want, essentially. Mm. Um, but, you know, it shouldn't really be like that. I don't think. You know, you should be able to go to them and say, "We, as a as a town or a city or or whatever, this is what we want," um, and say what we want rather than what your party says you should be saying. Um, so maybe this is a this is a good opportunity for France to to get a a better <laughs> a better bit of democracy out of it. I think there's definitely an opportunity. You're right. Um, the I would argue you can tell them this is what we want, but certainly they are likely to. Uh, you remember the times they ignore you. I think is is also fair to say, and they might ignore you many many times. But yeah, I think there's an opportunity there if uh, Macron and his government are intelligent enough to actually propose uh, significant measures. Uh, it that do address at least some of the concerns of that very uh, disparate, uh, not desperate, but uh, uh, very different people coming together, it could quell in the positive sense, you know, it could uh, uh, address these issues. And of course, he could just use that, ex that as an excuse to repackage the things he already wanted to do and 
if that happens, then next election we're going to see someone uh, that we might not like at the at the helm of the country. Yeah, but but Patrick, think about. I mean. Everything that I've seen coming out of the Macron administration in response to this feels like he's using old tactics for new problems. Now, remember that the Gilets Jaunes movement is very different than anything else we've seen in French history before. The French love to organize. You have unions, you've got syndics, you've got all these different groups, and traditionally there's this hierarchy. There was no hierarchy with the Gilets Jaunes. They were organizing on social media. There's no one for Macron really to negotiate who's got the legitimacy of the entire movement. That is a really, that so, so this idea of the Grand Débat for me is ridiculous at one level because people don't want to have talk. They're frustrated because there's no action. They got pissed off because of the taxes and the fact that they've had enough. And this is the same thing with the Brexit and even the people in rural America as well. And at the root of the problem in all of these different areas, and this is something people don't talk enough about, is the fundamental lie. And it is a lie because they were promised that with globalization, with the emergence of China into the WTO, that everything was going to be better. And it never has gotten better. And it's not going to get better. And they're still lying to them. The oligarchs are still protecting themselves. And, the, and this is the problem. The Gilets Jaunes have called Macron out for being a defender and protector of the rich, which he has been unapologetic in many respects of doing so. And he comes from the elites. And this is what people are fed up with. And they're so, understandably they're fed up with because they've been lied to for 40 years, saying you're going to get, this is going to help you. And in fact, it didn't. None of it helped them. I agree that this is absolutely the view of the Gilets Jaunes, the view of the people who voted for Trump, and probably the view of the people who voted for uh, Brexit. I'm not going to get into the argument of whether or not it did get better. I think it is... Well, wages in the United States froze in 1972. So we well, know for a fact. The data shows that benefits have gone down, wages have gone down, employment security has gone down. So I don't know how else you want to measure it, but at the end of the day, people's don't, their lives don't feel better today than they did in the uh -huh. 70s. That's important. Don't feel better. I, They're I, not better. I think, well, I mean, okay. by any standard, life expectancy of white Americans is literally going down. <laughs> I'm talking about, I'm well, yes, the America, the, the America is a very special case. And I would argue that everything, okay, I'm not going to argue that. Uh, in France, I don't think the picture is quite the same. Um, and beyond that question, which, again, I understand this is the view of many people, including the people in those movements, but I think the way to address it is difficult because you're right. It, it, there is no leader, although, you know, it's been three months now, you have a few people who are uh, representant of that movement, and you at least have a few heads you can think of when you want to um, address the issues or discuss with people who are uh, uh, legitimate in addressing these issues. But there are many people and themselves are saying, I don't represent. But that's the problem with citizens' unrests like it was with uh, Occupy Wall Street. You can't talk with them because there's no them, there's no they. But, so the way to address this is very difficult. It is incredibly difficult. And I think the best answer I've had to that problem might be that grand débat, because you, you can, you know, put down on the table the issue of, well, you, you don't know what the issues are. Because it's true, everyone has a different set of issues that they're putting forward. So you put the, the, that grand débat, that great debate, you ask everyone, okay, What do you want? If you can boil it down to like four important things that you want and you ask all the people who want to speak in the whole country and you get all the mayors, not, you know, many of whom aren't your friend as the government. You know, you have mayors from every uh, possible party in the country and we have many parties unlike, again, in the screwed up US. So you have very different sensibilities that are being, being represented. You bring all of that uh to your front door and your desk, you look at all of it and you think, okay, what can we do? These have an air of legitimacy because it's been put together by a process that is the best one we can think of short of a, you know, Facebook poll um, to, to, to get these issues in front of us. And then we try and see what we can do to address them. What is reasonable to do? What is kind of uh, a little bit less uh, feasible? And, and you try to uh, 
to, to address at least some of the problems for some of the people that are part of the movement. I'm not saying it's going to work. It could completely be uh, screwed up by uh, Macron and his government. But I don't see any other better way of addressing that. Do you, Eric? I, I, listen, but yes. I mean, li I don't need to have rolling f forums. They told us what they want. They want lower taxes. They want better schools. They want, you know, more job security. You don't need to have Conde Body hear what they want. Listen to them. And no, I, but it, that's when okay, you okay. say, but that's here's the thing. Different. When you, when I'm listening to you, it sounds like to me that you represent the elite who are trying to stall them out. Let's talk this thing through. And here's okay, the funny Eric, thing. Eric, but okay, here's the just funny a thing. Hold on one second, one second, one second. You have an hourglass. There, you don't have time on your side for this because you have elections that are going to be coming up in a couple of years. And Miss Marine Le Pen and her right wing is sitting out there loving all of this. So while you're having your grand debat for the next two years, it's if a few you don't months. resolve it's not two years, this, but okay. well, if you don't resolve this issue before the elections, uh, there is a very, very good chance that what happened in Britain and the United States can happen in France. I so agree. Time is not on your side for having all this discussion and talk. Listen I agree. to people. But talk Eric, to them. You're saying action has to follow. Yes. What action? L you want less taxes? No, they want more taxes, just not for them. They want better but, schools? Yes, of course. But they also want less taxes. They want more jobs. How do you do that? It's not like you have a button that you can press and it's like, jobs for everyone. Oh my God, I didn't realize I could have pressed that button. I, I'm sorry, I'm going to do it now. You know, it's like great yes, ideas, great but, complaints, yes. But if you ask thing. them concrete <laughs> measures, what do you want concretely, <laughs> then they so can. Here's the funny thing. You're talking about about having these grand débats and they've already told you what they want and you're reacting defensively to them. So here no, we, no, we no, don't no. have a no, I have a solution to this. No, what I'm saying <laughs> is Eric, what I'm saying is if you ask people, okay, you want less taxes. Where do you what do you cut in the budget? What do you want to if you want more taxes, who should pay them concretely? If you want uh you know, you want the referendum it, uh, how would that work? You you try to bring it back because it's easy to complain about abstract ideas. If you try to bring it back to concrete things, then maybe you can g get something out of the conversation. And if you don't try at least to have the conversation, then you're lost. What are you going to do? You're just, again, I, I ask you, they want more jobs? I don't think governments have not been trying to create more jobs before and of every type of government, Right. It's interesting. I think it's, it's um, you know, if you don't have one person, so if there isn't a, a spokesperson for a group, then then obviously it's kind of good for the group because there isn't one person who can be bought off. You know, there's not one person who you can say, oh, you want this, this and this. Oh, there you are. Now, please keep quiet and go away. Mm. Um, but equally, if you don't have one person to try and channel, as Patrick's saying, all of the detail through, then you're not going to get, you know, if you get 40 people in a room and, and ask them all what they want, they're all going to say something slightly different. So somebody has to be an arbiter at some point and say, well, yeah, you know, we've got 60% of the people want option A and 20% want option B and, you know, the rest didn't didn't offer an opinion. So, you know, leaderless group, good, because it, it kind of can't be silenced but also bad because it can't be silenced. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's, and it's kind of a... Um, you can't square the circle there. And I don't, I think you summed it up very well, Gareth. And I don't think, I think you're, you're posing the, the problem, Eric, very well as well. But you're also, just like many other people, are not offering a solution. Um, Listen, I, the solution, the problem is the, there's a contradiction in French society. And I, I grew up in France, have lived in France and worked mm -hmm. in France. And this idea that People want their cake and eat it too. They want, as you pointed out rightly, they want the best social benefits in the world. They want short working weeks. They want retirement at young ages. And at the same time, they want to have low taxes and they want to have all of, you know, they don't want to pay for it. Mm. Um, we know that it's not sustainable, just like the American military expenditures are not sustainable in the long run. Uh, our health care is not sustainable in the long run. The French system also is not sustainable in the long run, because as you rightly pointed out, something has to give. 
it's one of the big tragedies of, of France is that when you go abroad to London, Shanghai, San Francisco, you meet amazing young French people all over the world doing startups, generating businesses, doing amazing things. And you ask them, you say, why aren't you back home doing that? I said, oh, I could never do that back home. Too many regulations, too much. Uh, the unions are too much of a problem. All the different problems. Taxes are too high. And, and, and that's and the that elites. Is also you fundamentally were, part of it. That's the elites you were criticizing just a moment ago. Absolutely, because they're the only ones who have the ability to actually pack up and leave. Mm. The the average guy can't go and can't go anywhere. So I think you're in a real in a really big problem here. I'm not sure what I've seen out of Macron is rising to the challenge to be able to solve this problem. That's Until now, no, not at all. Until now, not yeah. at all. And I'm not even saying and the Gondi about would. I, I'm not saying flips the, to yeah. to the to the right wing like Italy has and like Eastern Europe is going. That's which, a big concern for me. Which is why I think, and I, I completely agree. You know, when he was first voted in, I thought, yes, he's going to address both issues. He hasn't, and that's why I've been disappointed with him. And I think that that's why I'm saying this happening now is an opportunity because there are three years before uh, the next election, and if and that's grand debat might be uh, one of the ways possibly it's the let's put it like that it might not work it will probably not work but it's the most sensible thing the most sensible way of addressing of trying to address the issue that i've heard about since the whole problem started in you know two or three years ago around the world um so if it doesn't work yes we might very well get either um marine le pen uh or the slightly less worrisome counterpart uh Mélenchon, who's on the, the left side of the aisle, and P French people get very angry at me when I compare the two. Uh, there are reasons why I compare the two, but uh, yes, Marine Le Pen would be worse, probably. Although, both of them have understood that arguing against Europe, against the EU, is probably not going to get them m any votes, or going to get them uh, uh, in, in a worse situation than not doing that. So they've mellowed a lot on the EU, so that's kind of a, a, a point of uh, uh, joy for me. But um, anyway, I guess we'll see. We'll follow that uh, story of the Grand Débat and we'll see if Eric's cynicism will win out in the end. I'm afraid <laughs> it might. Um, and since we're talking about the EU and how to address issues, one of the ways of addressing uh, growing discontent in a country is to ask a simple yes or no answer to a very complex question like people did in the UK <laughs> a couple of years ago. And, That's a uh, beautiful segue. Beautiful segue. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's, I mean, we've heard about the Brexit and the issue with Teresa, Ter uh, Theresa May and her plan being rejected, which essentially we're looking at this and thinking, could the train wreck get any more train wrecky? And I guess the answer is yes. Um, so I turn to Gareth. I guess the first... Uh, we've had people who were um, pro-Brexit on the show before. They are a rare breed, though. And I have to say, before I, I yield the floor to my colleague uh, in the UK, um, I have to say, I asked on Twitter publicly um, whether some people would be willing to come forward and, and discuss this. And a majority of the, the people who answered, um, it sounds like they were hundreds, but... I investigated a little bit more, and let's say they're the kind of people that I wouldn't be comfortable having on the show. Um, not the kind, it's more the kind of people that you would invite on a TV panel to have uh, never ending arguments. I think that's the impression I got, at least, than people who, who, will, who are just actual people uh, who would explain to you what they think about the situation. And that's fine. But I'm just noticing it's very hard to get people to come talk about the this specific issue. Um, and so thank you doubly, Gareth, for, for agreeing to be here. Um, so before we talk about what's been happening in the recent months, um, you voted leave. Can you explain to us your mindset, frame of mind and reasoning for, for that decision at the time? Yeah, so I think... Um yeah, you know, there's a, there's a few things. I mean, obviously, what you you've just said it, it's it would appear that that although there was a there was a just over fifty percent vote, 
it would appear that there is not just over 50% of the people in the UK who are willing to admit that they did vote to leave, um, and probably even less that would be willing to talk openly um, <laughs> on, a, mm. on a podcast about it. Um, <laughs> so I think at the time, you know, uh, we were given the option. So, so we can either stay in or we can leave. And as you say, it's, it's really not that straightforward a question, but that was the question that we were given. Um, you know, I do feel very strongly that we're in a democracy. There are lots and lots of people around the world who do not get the opportunity to vote. They they have to just put up with whatever's happening in their country. So I think it's really, really important that when people are given the option, they do go and vote and they make a decision. Um, but also, it's really, really difficult sometimes. So, so we've got, as you say, what is a really, really complex problem. We've got lots and lots of things in the media, um, you know, lots of papers saying different things. Um, and I know for a fact that at any given point in time, I could go to Google and I could say, right, is the UK going to be financially better or financially worse if we leave the EU? And I could find a number of articles written by a number of people who, if I bothered to do the due diligence, would check out as, you know, valid economists. And I could find arguments either way. And you could phrase the question, you know, would we be better or worse staying in? And again, you'd find articles going going both ways. So I kind of made the decision not to do too much research, which mm. sounds a little bit silly. And it sort of sounds like I'm contradicting myself. You know, I've, I've got this vote. Um, I should use it. <laughs> um, but I'm not actually going to bother doing any research. And, and that does sound ridiculous. But I just decided that no matter what the research I do, I'm going to come to that with some sort of bias, and I'm just going to find things that back up my bias. Um, so, so I went with my gut feeling, um, and I think it's all it's all very very similar. You know, the, the same. I think people who voted to to leave the EU in the UK are are probably being um, looked at in a very similar manner to to people who voted for Trump. Um, you know, why would you do that? You bunch of idiots. And maybe looking back, you sit it and think, uh, yeah, was was this the best idea? Mm. Are, um, are you yeah. saying that's that's the way uh, the way I, I describe it, the way I understand it in the case of Trump, and I think in the case of Brexit, it was a a, a, a way of venting frustration and uh, partly and giving the finger to people that you feel have been using you and lying to you for a long time. More than answering the question, is that accurate? Is that fair? Or I, I think I think it's a fair. I, I, I would like to think that that's not why I decided the, okay. <laughs> the way I did. But um, but uh, you know, I think there's and it's really difficult to make this sound like it's very uh, I don't know racist or, or um, um, yeah, which you know, we, I, I'm 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 absolutely not uh you know I, no, i'm not a racist um, but it's and, but, yeah, yeah. But, and, and it's, i know and it's, you say it's but, easy then. to make fun, yeah it's easy to make fun of uh that trope almost but at the same time if you discount it entirely every time sometimes try to express something that's why you get people who get so angry that they go and just i guess vote brexit because they're like well I don't care what you say anymore. Uh, but yeah, go ahead. So you're yeah, I mean, you're not I'm a sure racist, think... <laughs> but it was, but but, it, but there was but, a concern about yeah. Well, I think I think maybe maybe nationalist would be a better term. But again, you know that ends up being you know all of these terms get lumped into the same kind of camp really, and um, yeah, it's difficult. It's difficult really, and that's you know one of the reasons why I think you, you struggle to get people to come. Mm. to come and, so, and so speak why, their mind about it. But Why did you, I guess, sorry, I have one extra question okay. because it sticks to my mind when I think Brexit. It's that number, which I can't even remember what it was. The out, You say there's. it was very difficult to, to make up your mind and to do proper research. But, the you know, it, for the people on my side of the, the issue, uh, the pro-EU people, um, it seemed like the things that were being... Um, uh, uh, talked about or announced by the pro Brexit people were outrageous like the the number of the side of the bus you know that the NHS would be funded in a week if only we didn't give 250 million a day to the EU you know that thing which has has i think been proven to be uh bollocks uh, by now and i'm guessing most brexiters understand that this is this wasn't real so in that sense 
do you look at it back now and think, well, maybe that side was a little bit less truthful than the other, but the underlying sentiment is still real? Or, you know, how do you look at this from here now? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that there are some clear and obvious things that, that were done and things that were said um, that, in hindsight, were clearly, as you say, clearly bollocks. Mm. Um, but does it change the, your, your... Well, I, I don't think it does. I mean, the, the only thing that I would mm. say at this point is that had I realised that we as a country would make such a mess of um, sorting the, the, you know, the detail out, then I might not have voted to leave. Um, I still, I don't know, I, I think fundamentally, you, you know, I had a, so my feelings were that we've been part of Europe since, you know, the early, the early 70s. Um, but it kind of feels like the UK didn't really have control over lots of aspects of its own uh, operation. Um, so, you know, control over some laws, control over borders, control over um, who was making the decisions. Um, and again, you know, in a similar, you know, we have the, the, the grand debate so that people get, you know, get to have more of a voice about what's happening. Um, that's that's kind of great as long as it doesn't then get to 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 uh, to the government in France, who then can't change anything because because of EU regulation. <laughs> but did, um, you, did you think through your vote in terms of all those Nissan cars that are made in England and that are shipped to the European Union and all of the subsidies for education that come from Brussels into the European, you know, there was this idea that, you know what, it's going to be okay. We're going to do a trade deal with them, like Trump's talking about. We're going to negotiate these trade deals. But at the end of the day, Merkel and, and, and the French were absolutely right. You're out, you're out. Yeah, you're I mean, not I, I, getting a free trade access into it, <laughs> and I just don't think that that second part was ever really considered deeply about what the real costs would be. No, and I, and I think my honest opinion is that that I assumed, and, and we all know that you know assumptions not a great thing, mm -hmm. um, but I assumed that the politicians that were there to represent me would um, would get us a deal you know would 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 be able to go and and have you know sensible polite conversations with people and say right okay we would we would like to come out of the eu but we'd still like to be able to sell you cars so can we agree on what terms we're still going to sell you cars and and yeah you know we might get we might get the middle finger from europe saying huh you're leaving you're going to get a deal but it's not going to be anywhere near as good but i didn't really ever think that we'd be in a position where it was no, we're just walking away. You know, I, I, I made the assumption that that we would be able to broker mm. a deal. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, beyond, you know, beyond the issues that make the deal impossible to broker in the way that Brexiters want it, which I think is the core of the issue, I think the, the situation we're in now is Brexiters want a certain deal or no deal at all. And the deal that they want is, you know, to make a deal, you have to get both parties to agree. And the deal they want is kind of, well, no, I don't, you know, the EU is like, this is not what we want. So the only other option would be a no deal. So that's the one that is left on the table. But I want to get back to something that you said a little bit earlier. You said, you know, had I known it would have been so complicated, I might not have voted for the Brexit, which to me is equally dangerous because if you don't for, vote for Brexit for that reason um, and not because you have actually uh, uh, the, the, the people who are in charge of this have explained to you what the exact conditions would be it, it, it feels like you're giving up and you're like well F you then I'm just not going to vote whatever and, and that is what leads to resentment in the long run right so I don't think that would be that would have been the solution either but you're saying so I don't know exactly where I'm going but I think I think where I'm going is, given the way the situation has evolved now, you seem to be more disillusioned or equally disillusioned or like, well, that was kind of a bust and I'm no more, I'm not happier. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a, that's a reasonable way of putting it. So, you know, I definitely feel more disillusioned and, um, you know, I, I, I would absolutely still be going out and voting. But I think it, 
it's it's had it's not necessarily had I realised how complicated it would be because you, you know I'm whilst I'm not an economist I'm not a politician I'm you know I'm not I'm not daft so clearly it's going to be complicated clearly it's going to take a lot of time but when when you're looking at you know right well we've got over two years to sort this out mm. and you know two years not necessarily a massive amount of time in in government terms you know th- these things move slowly but it's still two years that's a lot of time that if it's given the priority it should have been given it's a lot of time for people to work things out um, so do you think it hasn't been given the priority like how how are your feelings now uh given the the cluster f uh from the past few weeks it, well it, yeah it just sort of feels like all of a sudden you know <laughs> coming up to to november maybe people have gone oh oh no this isn't this isn't done yet um oh we better actually pull our fingers out and you know and get this resolved really and so you then don't established. you don't think they've been working on it really really you know as hard as they could and be, having been dealt a really bad hand like the the british government have has been held a super bad hand because one of the you know when we, we look at it from here we look at the uk and we're like you already had the best deal you could get if you wanted to trade with the eu you didn't have the money you had you know all the 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 euro you had a lot of exceptions like the the other pushing it further is having no uh, uh fair deal of any kind and that's a sentiment we had from the get go um so i wonder why you're thinking they were twiddling them th- their thumbs until now and they weren't actively trying to get a deal that it turns out is so impossible to get that the only other option is a hard Brexit. Why do you know. think I, they have been doing nothing, I guess? Uh, because I, I don't necessarily think... Um, it, it doesn't seem that there has been maybe the, same, the, the sense of urgency that... Mm. I, I don't know. Again, you know, it's it's a it's a gut feeling. I'm not an economist. I'm not a politician. I don't. Sure. I don't no, but that's what I'm asking. Things, uh, I'm, I'm but, asking for your gut feeling. Why do you? Um, yeah, it, it it really does feel like it. It's been a little bit of a. Um, we have oh, two yeah, years. We'll, whatever. We'll work that out. Yeah, we'll work that mm. out next week. We'll we'll work that out. Yeah. No, the detail of that bit. Yeah, we'll worry about that later. Mm. Uh, and then it's got to a point where everyone, as I say, has just kind of gone, oh, oh, crap. No, this is this is. So what happens if we haven't got a deal? Oh, right. <laughs> Oh right, okay. No, we better sort this out then. Mm. Uh, so, so what do you uh, think of of Theresa May? I think that she's getting a lot of a lot of stick, a lot of grief, and I think that she is probably doing the best she possibly can. Um, and I think maybe is a, a, a Patsy's probably not the, the the right word really, but you know she's been scapegoated maybe. You know the the decision was made under one under one prime minister, and another is now having to deal with it. I am fairly sure that she won't survive. You know the situation. But in fact, I think she she has said that she's going to stand down once this is all done. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think she's hated mm. by by a, a large amount of people uh, for doing the best job that she that she can really. Mm. Um, and I think that's a bit of a shame, really, but. It's also kind of what happens. So, so do you see a way out of it? Because looking at it from here again, and I, I don't even know how it's looked at from China and if they're even discussing the Brexit, uh, but it's looking like I don't know how this is going to work out. There's no solution. <laughs> no, I mean, there have been some, there were some amendments tabled yesterday in Parliament, uh, and I haven't, I haven't caught up on, on how that voting went, but. It does seem that, you know, one of the biggest stumbling blocks at the moment is what's going on um, with the Irish border, which I know, I know you talked about in the in the last podcast. Um, mm-hmm. And again, you know, I don't know what the solution is there. That's kind of what I hope we pay our politicians to <laughs> to, mm. to know and be able to work out. Um, but you know, I guess. I guess if we have to go with no deal, then we have to go with no deal because. The, you know the country voted to leave you know maybe you know there's a there's a there's a group of people who who like me made the assumption that the government would sort themselves out and would go to europe and would agree a deal 
and that it might not be as good a deal as we have currently, but that it would give us a little bit more autonomy. It, you know, it'd give us back some of our autonomy, issue, mm. maybe, um, and and you know, and I'm disenfranchised or you know, really, really upset with the government essentially for for taking our vote and then not really doing with it what they probably ought to have done. So um, you really think that the UK would be better off on its own away from the EU? I think better off is a is a very broad term. So I think it's difficult to just say better off. Mm. Um, I think financially, it, it looks quite clear that in the short term, we will not be better off. Um, but that potentially in the long term, that would balance itself out again. Um, we, we would be better off in, in regards, we would have greater control over what happens within the UK. Um, and I think that, that the people within the UK would have um, better access to the people that are making those decisions. Um, in what way? How would that work? Well, well, again, you know, it feels very much like um, laws enacted by the EU take precedent over, over local law. Um, but the people that make the laws in the EU I mean, I, I have no idea if I wanted to go and talk to um, to the person that represents me within the EU. I have no idea who that is, and maybe that's maybe that's a fault of, on my part because I've never taken the time to find that out. Um, but I know who well, my local MP is. Right. I think. I mean, there is certainly in that context a, a responsibility on the people who do represent you in the EU, and certainly the EU for most countries, I'm sure, of the EU feels like a distant thing. But it's not that hard to to find out. Now, whether or not, you know, you feel like you're being heard when you send them an email, maybe not, but it, would it be less with your local MP? It's, I don't know. It it sort of feels like it does, because it's, it's, it's one less level of, of bureaucracy that you've got to, you've mm. got to work through. So, you know, if I talk to my MP, my MP then goes to Parliament and could potentially have a discussion about the things that are bothering me. Mm. Um, I don't necessarily think that would that would work the same with my member of the European Parliament, who I could say whoever that is. I'm being mm. slightly, uh, slightly, slightly silly there, but um, yeah. So you know, it's it's another it's another level of bureaucracy which maybe we do or don't need. It's more red tape. It's more um, regulation. And so it's really the feeling of agency over your country's uh, decision making process that is the prime motivator. Yeah, the, yeah, there's, that's definitely a large part. Yeah. Mm. And you don't see benefits from being in the EU, or at least I'm guessing not enough, but that's also a failure of EU of showing the many, many benefits that we get. But no, I mean, I think it, you know, it is, it is clear that there, you know, there are things that, that, are a benefit. I just don't necessarily see why those things need to come from the EU. You know, we, we've got lots and lots of lots and lots of workers' rights, for example, from from EU legislation. Well, that's fine, but but you know, the UK could have made that legislation by itself, yeah. and it could have been tailored slightly more to to work within the UK. Uh, and that's not you know, that's not to say that 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 specific bit of legislation doesn't work in the UK, but it would be easier for us to say, yeah, actually, no, that bit doesn't quite work. Um, mm. You know, so let's let's tweak that and make it better for, for the way the UK is. Um, so, mm. yes, you know, there are lots and lots of benefits, but I'm not, you know, I'm not convinced personally that... You that couldn't get them otherwise. You yeah. couldn't have them, yeah, any other mm. way. Um, mm. Yeah, so... <laughs> I think it's going to be quite sobering for, for a lot of people when the city will become a lot smaller than it is today. I mean, I think Goldman Sachs and most of the major financial houses are starting to look on the uh, to, to move out of, out of the UK, at least consider their options uh, to what happens. I think you're going to see the companies like Nissan and VW and others who used to use the UK as a manufacturing point into the European Union, they're going to reconsider. Um, it's going to be painful and ugly. And um, in what was, I mean, again, I don't, disagree with anything you're saying, but there are going to be, you know, we say in the United States elections have consequences, and I think the consequences are going to be very, very brutal 
in many respects and in ways that we haven't yet to even consider. Um, because most people assume, like what you were saying, that some they got to do something, right? But when Goldman Sachs is looking for massive amounts of real estate in Frankfurt or wherever, I think it was in Germany, because they want to relocate big parts of their operations out of out of London, that's that's, that's bad news. Yeah, it's, it's definitely that's not. really really bad news. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really and it's bad it for uh, it's it's bad for the optics. It's bad for the tax revenue. It's bad for the the fact that there are you know people who are earning good salaries who are buying real estate and property and things like that. Whatever it is, you know the whole thing, and and it just makes you know London will not be as important a place as it was as it was, and it'll continue you know Britain's sad decline into second and third rate status on the, on the world stage. <laughs> so that's the elitist view of the remain voters eric thank you for uh oh, yeah. that that is fine, actually, not to say that there's a value judgment there are consequences mm. i'm not even saying that, that that they should that that people just have to accept the consequences of what's happened but that but and I that's not they, saying that the, the remains you know i don't think they they are expecting those consequences uh and and so that's why the frustration of many people uh, from the Remain camp is so strong. It's that, you know, Gareth, you're saying, oh, but I, I, I assumed they would work something out and they would work on it. And you're, you're, the way you're explaining it is, well, they didn't really worry about it until it was too late, right? But what if yeah. they did and they couldn't come to a, uh, to, to a satisfactory arrangement? What if they were working on it as hard as they could and they didn't manage because they have been handed an impossible uh, problem to solve? And well, I, I, don't think it, I don't think it is an impossible problem to solve. It, it mm. might, you know, they have, we, we as a country have been offered a deal by the EU. We could take that deal. But the Brexiters don't want it. But the yeah, so but that's that's so that's the problem is you know we've decided we want Brexit. If if these are the terms under which Brexit has to happen, then I feel that the the politicians that are representing me should have said, well, it's not a great deal, but it's what we've got. So, do so you we think, have to take it. Yeah, but the problem is the deal was essentially well, situation is kind of the same on those issues you worry about, but you have even less of a say in what happens in the EU. So I understand why the people who wanted the Brexit then go to, well, we want a hard Brexit, which, you know, again, I'm not trying to convince anyone here. I'm just trying to explain how I see things. A hard Brexit leads to even more of the unintended consequences that the people who want Brexit are complaining about, right? So it's, again, this impossible thing. I don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah, and maybe, uh, you know, again, if if the people in charge of the country had any kind of idea that it would be impossible, mm. then we shouldn't have been given the option. Yeah, I but, guess that, you know, that Cameron, <laughs> so, it, it is absolutely Cameron's fault um, yeah, you know, at I, the I was, basis of it. Yeah. I was given the choice. I, I made a decision based on, you know, as, as I've said, I, my, my gut at the time, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not going to try and read up on this because it could all be made up. Um, but I'm going to trust my government have given me a choice that is doable. You know, that they're, they're not saying, would you like, would you like this or nothing? That there is two choices. They're essentially saying, would you like the situation you have now or a talking monkey? And they're like, well, yeah. the talking monkey sounds nice. And you choose yeah, the talking monkey. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, right. Sorry. We didn't think you wanted you would want the talking monkey. Actually, we don't have any talking monkeys yes. available. Yeah, we, we have a non-talking ferret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, at that point, yeah. you, you know, as a, as a voter, you turn around and say, oh, well, well, thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, what I wanted is, is kind of mm. what I was is what I assumed was what you were offering uh, rather than... Yeah, that's uh, a really interesting way of, of looking at this issue because I never really thought of, well, you're asking me the question, you're David Cameron, I, I suppose you kind of know what you're talking about. It was, I think everyone agrees, it was incredibly irresponsible of him to do that, but uh, 
Hmm. Yeah, and know, then you know, it's. But I don't know whether that's. I don't know whether that's an easy thing to say in hindsight or not. You know, I, I right. at the time maybe he maybe they did think that there was that there was going to be another option. But no, I you, think you he know. thought he would. He thought people would never vote to leave the the EU. He he yeah, was convinced which, that it wouldn't happen. But. Which which if you know if that is the case, then then yeah, you know it. it it was political maneuvering. He was trying to comfort his uh, seat by getting a yes vote, and then things would have been fine. And of course, then uh, Johnson and Farage happened, and they put big numbers on sides of buses, and everyone believed them, which is, I guess we should have seen it coming. I don't know. It was the first one, so we maybe we couldn't have. But um, yeah. Hmm. It's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It is, but I yeah. definitely, you know, I had never considered that idea that the 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 choice you're being given was rigged from the start. And yeah, and maybe that's kind of what I mean by they, you know, they they've taken too long over deciding. You know, maybe maybe and I'm just sort of I'm thinking this through as I'm speaking obviously, but maybe I just sort of assumed that because we were given the choice, there was already a plan. You know, there was already a, you know, a precedent, a, well, if you come out of the EU, there's, you know, there's the World Trade Organization, there's the standard rules of, of commerce. So, you know, my, my logic was probably, and as I say, I am, mm. I am thinking this backwards a little bit, but it was kind of, well, we, we've been given two choices. They must have thought this through already. There must be an option B. Mm. There, there, must, there must be. Because right. why would they why would they offer us? Yeah, it makes <laughs> there sense. must be a talking monkey. They must have it. It must be in a <laughs> box there. And uh, you know, and then to find out that they thought that they might be able to find the talking monkey, but they haven't actually found the talking monkey yet. But mm. they're going to carry on telling us for two years that they well they found a monkey, and they found some people that talk. So maybe they'll get them to talk to the monkey, and then maybe the <laughs> monkey will start talking. And yeah, okay, and so then eventually they say, "Oh no, actually, no, we just don't have that. No, no monkeys, no talking. No, <laughs> no monkeys, no <laughs> nothing." Um, yeah. So then I'll ask you another uh, question, um, and we're going to conclude the show very soon. But how do you feel about the people on the other side of the uh, question now? The um, the the remainers is there? I, I, hesi I hesitate even to say, uh, is there a, a dialogue that's happening? Like, how do you interact with them if you interact at all? How is the situation? Yeah, I mean, I, it was um, it was my birthday yesterday, so I was out with a couple of friends for 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 some for some dinner and was chatting with with one of them who thinks we should stay, um, and that's fine. You know, we can have a conversation about that. We have differing opinions. Um, you know, they had different food to me. Uh, you, because they like different food that's fine you know everyone mm. everyone can have their opinion as as far as i'm concerned it's not it's not a problem um and we might we might not agree but again that's you know that's that's fine having different people with different opinions kind of makes the world interesting mm. um I, I do find it frustrating there seems to be a, a lot of a lot of people who are saying well we should have another vote and you I don't think, want another vote uh, do you know I think it would be silly to have another vote. Um, you know, we have referendums very, very infrequently. And if you start having a referendum and then two years later when people don't like the results, start having it again, then it kind of negates yeah. the point of having it. You know, if you're just going to keep having, oh, no, no, we still don't like it. Yeah, mm. yeah, we'll try it again in, uh, in two years' time. We'll try it again. I, I just don't really see... Mm -hmm. Obviously, people should be given the chance to to change their mind, I guess. But have but you I don't changed know what yours? Time frame. I, I don't think we've asked that question directly. Uh, I don't would know. you vote Brexit <laughs> again? You don't know. Okay, I, I don't know. Well, I think I think the honest answer is that if I knew now, if I sorry, if I knew then what I know now, then I would not have voted Brexit. So that's not to say that I. Mm. But not because you don't want the Brexit, because you understand it, it can't be done for whatever reason, being realistic or politicians or it's a mess. And yeah. But you yeah, still you would know, like to Brexit in theory. I, I, yeah, I would like the UK to have more autonomy over its mm. own, you know, its, <clears throat> its, its laws and um, to be able to make trade agreements with 
other countries how you know we decide that we want to rather than it having to be through the eu um Hmm. That you know, there's the immigration policy, which is a really difficult one to mention because that's the one where you immediately just get branded as a as a racist. But you know, it is another thing that's important. You know, I think it's you know you should allow people into a country to fill jobs that need to be filled. Hmm. Um, you know, I think people just moving around because they fancy it is difficult because you know we do have a and again while it gets knocked and, and bashed to pieces, we have the NHS. Um, and it's a good service. It struggles in places, and you know I've been trying to get a doctor's appointment for the last week, and I can't get through to them. But but I know that you know if I fell over in the street, there would be an ambulance. I would be taken to hospital. I would be looked after. I might be in a bed in a corridor, but at least I'm going to be getting looked after. Um, so if I was in a country where that wasn't an option, mm. then I might look at the UK and think, yeah, well actually they you know they. They don't need any IT people over there, but I'm an IT person. And if I go over there, I'm going to get looked after better by the government. So, uh, mm. yeah, I'm going to go over there. Yeah. Well, I uh, think the IT example is probably everyone needs IT people uh, well, yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's, you know, um, I, I would like us to have more, more say over what we do as a country. Mm. I thought that Brexit would be the solution to that. And it's becoming clear that that it mm. isn't, um, and whether that's yeah. that it couldn't be or that it can't be, or you know, I don't really know. But it's it doesn't appear that that is the solution. So what do you? Okay, last question. I promise. How do you see the next? I mean, I was going to say two years, but Brexit is in March. Um, how do you see the next six months? I guess is the question. What do you think is going to happen? I think I'm probably going to start stockpiling baked beans and hp brown sauce um <laughs> i feel you're not and, joking and medicine well yeah uh, slightly tongue-in-cheek but hmm. are you okay no serious every- serious serious <laughs> talk time are, are you actually going to start stockpiling stuff because i wouldn't fault you for it i mean but i don't know are you no no okay no but uh, but i wouldn't be surprised if there were lots of people in the country that did hmm. Um, but I think that's the sort of thing that starts leading to, you know, shortages on the shelves, and then that starts getting into the press, and then people start panicking, and then, and then right. you end it's up. It's with irresponsible a, because you create chaos. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the last thing that we need is the country internally going to to rack and ruin when actually we didn't really need to. Mm. We, you know, we may start running out of drugs we may start running out of certain types of food we you know we may not mm. <laughs> so you know i think to go and start creating problems because there might be problems later down the line is really really irresponsible um mm. but all right people will <laughs> people will well um i think that is uh, probably enough depressing discussions for today <laughs> But yeah. um, I, I, I really want to thank you both for, for being on the show. And uh, of course, Eric, it's always a pleasure to have you on. And especially Gareth, thank you for agreeing to come and, and talk about this. Um, it's I know it's uh, not easy, but hopefully we have made a uh, comfortable home uh, for you to, to have a, yeah, a just, safe just- discussion. Just not thinking about all of the people on the internet listening to me talking. That's the, uh... <laughs> <laughs> that's the key. But that's, that's what we do. That's what we do yeah. on this show. I think that's why we have genuine conversations. It's because we're just people talking about stuff in a natural way. We're not, you know, I, I, I'm not going to bash the press, but it's not the same kind of thing that you get out of them. And it's very important to have that conversation in a, in a way that is not hyper-partisan because often conversations on the internet are and really trying to understand what the other person is saying and yeah and i think that's what you know that's why i I, that's why i I, as i said on on twitter that's why i'll stick my neck out and say yeah go on let's let's give it a go because i you know have listened to your stuff before and and know that that's kind of the way you work so i was hoping that i wouldn't get uh (laughs) yeah it wouldn't get burned burned at the stake (laughs) (laughs) well hopefully hopefully you haven't so um Excellent. Uh, before we leave, as always, uh, Eric, would you mind telling us where we can get more of your stuff and the China Africa podcast and project? 
Absolutely. So uh, ChinaAfricaProject.com, we produce uh, a weekly podcast. Uh, and also we have an email newsletter. And you can follow me on Twitter uh, at eolander, that's E-O-L-A-N-D-E-R, where I'm tweeting uh, every day uh, on uh, China Africa issues. And finally, on LinkedIn, where we have this amazing conversation. And LinkedIn is so exciting because it's the only social network that can interact with Chinese. So we have Chinese and Africans having discussions every day on these kind of really big, important issues. And so I would love for everybody to join us. So just search for China Africa on uh, China Africa Project on Project LinkedIn? And on, well, no, on, look for me on LinkedIn, Eric Olander. And uh, you'll find a, a really robust discussion under my uh, on, under my oh, okay. posts. So, so just your, look for me, Eric Olander. It, cool. It's on my personal page. Very cool. And we were talking about just before the show about Facebook. Your Facebook page has a million uh, subscribers. Uh, not altogether, we're over a million now. So on on Facebook, on LinkedIn, it's about seven hundred and twenty thousand now. Uh, look, uh, Facebook is about a quarter of a million, and then our That's podcast insane. is doing about thirty thousand a month now on the podcast. And so, it's really uh, people are really interested in this topic, and we would love to have all of your listeners come and join our discussions. Like you, we try to have a very civil. <laughs> polite, respectful conversation. That's really what we do. And and we're nonpartisan. We don't take opinion. We're not trying to persuade anybody of anything. We just want to have people have good discussions about really important issues that don't really get covered in the uh, traditional media very much. Yeah, I think if you're, you care about what's going to be happening in the next couple of centuries, China and Africa are places you should be looking at, for sure. It's uh, about a third of humanity is in those two places, <laughs> two and a half billion people. So you know, it's, it's a lot of people. And that's why we need the EU, because 400 million people is better than 60. We have more weight and, and voice. Anyway, mm. uh, Gareth, uh, what about you? Do you, have, do you have any active stuff online that you uh, want to promote? Uh, no, I mean, I, I, nothing, nothing quite so grand. You know, I, I, do, I do very, very occasionally... Uh, Tweet on on at Gareth Westwood um, on on Twitter, but yeah, nothing, uh, no podcasts, no no websites, uh, but yeah, the if, Twitter uh, account. That's yeah, that, a that's, Twitter account. <laughs> uh, still something, and I will have links to both Eric's and uh, Gareth's Twitter accounts on in the show notes. For me. It's not Patrick on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can find the show at frenchspin.com. And of course, the support for the show comes from the wonderful patrons that uh, go to patreon.com slash the Phileas Club and actually give their money to allow the show to exist. So if you want, you know, we keep saying referendums and votes aren't that important. I think there's one thing that is really important that you can do and that's to go to patreon.com slash the Phileas Club and vote with your dollars because it is an, an American site so it is in dollars um, and uh, decide that you want to support something you enjoy and you like and that brings you uh, uh, something every month or every a couple of times a month and that's the Phileas Club so if you enjoy the show please consider doing that the link is in the show notes Thank you so much for listening to us and we will be back in a few weeks for another episode. Talk to you then. Bye.